Chapter One, Part Two of The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gift Bestowed, Part Two. As he fell a musing in his chair alone, the healthy holly withered on the wall and dropped dead branches. As the gloom and shadow thickened behind him in that place where it had been gathering so darkly, it took by slow degrees, or out of it there came by some unreal, unsubstantial process not to be traced by any human sense, an awful likeness of himself. Ghastly and cold, colourless in its leaden face and hands, but with his features and his bright eyes and his grizzled hair, and dressed in the gloomy shadow of his dress, it came into his terrible appearance of existence, motionless, without a sound. As he leaned his arm upon the elbow of his chair, ruminating before the fire, it leaned upon the chair-back, close above him, with its appalling copy of his face looking where his face looked, and bearing the expression his face bore. This, then, was the something that had passed and gone already. This was the dread companion of the haunted man. It took, for some moments, no more apparent heed of him than he of it. The Christmas waits were playing somewhere in the distance, and through his thoughtfulness he seemed to listen to the music. It seemed to listen, too. At length he spoke, without moving or lifting up his face. Here again, he said. Here again, replied the phantom. I see you in the fire, said the haunted man. I hear you in music, in the wind, in the dead stillness of the night. The phantom moved its head, assenting. Why do you come to haunt me thus? I come as I am called, replied the ghost. No, unbidden, exclaimed the chemist. Unbidden be it, said the spectre. It is enough. I am here. Hitherto the light of the fire had shone on the two faces, if the dread lineaments behind the chair might be called a face, both addressed towards it as at first, and neither looking at the other. But now the haunted man turned suddenly and stared upon the ghost. The ghost, as sudden in its motion, passed to before the chair and stared on him. The living man and the animated image of himself dead might so have looked, the one upon the other, an awful survey in a lonely and remote part of an empty old pile of building on a winter night, with the loud wind going by upon its journey of mystery, whence or whither no man knowing since the world began and the stars in unimaginable millions glittering through it from eternal space, where the world's bulk is as a grain, and its hoary age is infancy. Look upon me, said the spectre. I am he, neglected in my youth and miserably poor, who strove and suffered, and still strove and suffered, until I hewed out knowledge from the mine where it was buried, and made rugged steps thereof for my worn feet to rest and rise on. I am that man, returned the chemist. No mother's self-denying love, pursued the phantom. No father's counsel aided me. A stranger came in to my father's place when I was but a child, and I was easily an alien from my mother's heart. My parents, at the best, were of that sort whose care soon ends, 
and whose duty is soon done, who cast their offspring loose early, as birds do theirs, and if they do well, claim the merit, and if ill, the pity. It paused and seemed to tempt and goad him with its look, and with the manner of its speech, and with its smile. I am he, pursued the phantom, who in this struggle upward found a friend. I made him, won him, bound him to me. We worked together, side by side, all the love and confidence that in my earlier youth had had no outlet and found no expression. I bestowed on him. Not all, said Redlaw hoarsely. No, not all, returned the phantom. I had a sister. The haunted man, with his head resting on his hands, replied, I had. The phantom, with an evil smile, drew closer to the chair and resting its chin upon its folded hands, its folded hands upon the back, and looking down into his face with searching eyes that seemed instinct with fire, went on, Such glimpses of the light of home as I had ever known had streamed from her. How young she was, how fair, how loving. I took her to the first poor roof that I was master of, and made it rich. She came into the darkness of my life, and made it bright. She is before me. I saw her in the fire, but now I hear her in music, in the wind, in the dead stillness of the night, returned the haunted man. Did he love her? said the phantom, echoing his contemplative tone. I think he did once. I am sure he did. Better had she loved him less, less secretly, less dearly, from the shallower depths of a more divided heart. Let me forget it, said the chemist, with an angry motion of his hand. Let me blot it from my memory. The spectre, without stirring, and with its unwinking, cruel eyes still fixed upon his face, went on. A dream like hers stole upon my own life. It did, said Redlaw. A love as like hers, pursued the phantom, as my inferior nature might cherish, arose in my own heart. I was too poor to bind its object to my fortune then by any thread of promise or entreaty. I loved her far too well to seek to do it. But more than ever I had striven in my life, I strove to climb. Only an inch gained brought me something nearer to the height. I toiled up. In the late pauses of my labour at that time, my sister, sweet companion, still sharing with me the expiring embers and the cooling hearth, when day was breaking, what pictures of the future did I see? I saw them in the fire, but now, he murmured, they come back to me in music, in the wind, in the dead stillness of the night in the revolving years. Pictures of my own domestic life in after time, with her who was the inspiration of my toil. Pictures of my sister made the wife of my dear friend on equal terms, for he had some inheritance, we none. Pictures of our sobered age and mellowed happiness, and of the golden links extending back so far that should bind us and our children in a radiant garland, said the phantom. Pictures, said the haunted man, 
that were delusions. Why is it my doom to remember them too well? Delusions, echoed the phantom in its changeless voice, and glaring on him with its changeless eyes. For my friend, in whose breast my confidence was locked as in my own, passing between me and the centre of the system of my hopes and struggles, won her to himself and shattered my frail universe. My sister, doubly dear, doubly devoted, doubly cheerful in my home, lived on to see me famous, and my old ambition so rewarded when its spring was broken. And then... Then died, he interposed, died gentle as ever, happy, and with no concern but for her brother. Peace. The phantom watched him silently. Remembered, said the haunted man after a pause. Yes, so well remembered that even now, when years have passed, and nothing is more idle or more visionary to me than the boyish love so long outlived, I think of it with sympathy, as if it were a younger brother's or a son's. Sometimes I even wonder when her heart first inclined to him, and how it had been affected towards me. Not lightly once, I think. But that is nothing. Early unhappiness, a wound from a hand I loved and trusted, and a loss that nothing can replace, outlive such fancies. Thus, said the phantom, I bear within me a sorrow and a wrong. Thus I prey upon myself. Thus memory is my curse. And if I could forget my sorrow and my wrong, I would. Mocker, said the chemist, leaping up and making with a wrathful hand at the throat of his other self. Why have I always that taunt in my ears? Forbear, exclaimed the spectre in an awful voice. Lay a hand on me and die. He stopped midway as if its words had paralysed him, and stood looking on it. It had glided from him, it had its arm raised high in warning, and a smile passed over its unearthly features as it reared its dark figure in triumph. If I could forget my sorrow and wrong, I would, the ghost repeated, if I could forget my sorrow and wrong, I would. Evil spirit of myself, returned the haunted man in a low, trembling tone. My life is darkened by that incessant whisper. It is an echo, said the phantom. If it be an echo of my thoughts, as now indeed I know it is, rejoined the haunted man. Why should I therefore be tormented? It is not a selfish thought. I suffer it to range beyond myself. All men and women have their sorrows, most of them their wrongs, in gratitude and sordid jealousy and interest besetting all degrees of life. Who would not forget their sorrows and their wrongs? Who would not? truly, and be the happier and better for it, said the phantom. These revolutions of years which we commemorate, proceeded Redlaw, what do they recall? Are there any minds in which they do not reawaken some sorrow or some trouble? What is the remembrance of the old man who was here tonight, a tissue of sorrow and trouble? But common natures, said the phantom, with its evil smile upon its glassy face, 
Unenlightened minds and ordinary spirits do not feel or reason on these things like men of higher cultivation and profounder thought. Tempter, answered Redlaw, whose hollow look and voice I dread more than words can express, and from whom some dim foreshadowing of greater fear is stealing over me while I speak, I hear again an echo of my own mind. "'Receive it as a proof that I am powerful,' returned the ghost. "'Hear what I offer. Forget the sorrow, wrong, and trouble you have known.' "'Forget them,' he repeated. "'I have the power to cancel their remembrance, to leave but very faint, confused traces of them that will die out soon,' returned the spectre. "'Say, it is done.' "'Stay!' cried the haunted man, arresting by a terrified gesture the uplifted hand. "'I tremble with distrust and doubt of you, and the dim fear you cast upon me deepens into a nameless horror I can hardly bear. I would not deprive myself of any kindly recollection, or any sympathy that is good for me or others. What shall I lose if I assent to this?' What else will pass from my remembrance? No knowledge, no result of study, nothing but the intertwisted chain of feelings and associations, each in its turn, dependent on and nourished by the banished recollections. Those will go. Are they so many? said the haunted man, reflecting in alarm. They have been wont to show themselves in the fire, in music, in the wind, in the dead stillness of the night, in the revolving years, returned the phantom scornfully. In nothing else? The phantom held its peace. But having stood before him silent for a little while, it moved towards the fire, then stopped. "'Decide,' it said, "'before the opportunity is lost.' "'A moment. I call heaven to witness,' said the agitated man, "'that I have never been a hater of my kind, "'never morose, indifferent, or hard to anything around me. "'If, living here alone, I have made too much of all that was "'and might have been, and too little of what is,' The evil, I believe, has fallen on me, and not on others. But if there were poison in my body, should I not, possessed of antidotes and knowledge how to use them, use them? If there be poison in my mind, and through this fearful shadow I can cast it out, shall I not cast it out? Say, said the spectre, is it done? A moment longer, he answered hurriedly. I would forget it if I could. Have I thought that alone? Or has it been the thought of thousands upon thousands, generation after generation? All human memory is fraught with sorrow and trouble. My memory is as the memory of other men, but other men have not this choice. Yes, I close the bargain. Yes, I will forget my sorrow, wrong, and trouble. Say, said the spectre, is it done? It is. It is. And take this with you, man whom I here renounce. The gift that I have given, you shall give again, go where you will. Without recovering yourself the power that you have yielded up, you shall henceforth destroy its like in all whom you approach. Your wisdom has discovered that the memory of sorrow, wrong, and trouble is the lot of all mankind, and that mankind would be the happier in its other memories without it. Go, be its benefactor, freed from such remembrance, from this hour, 
carry involuntarily the blessing of such freedom with you. Its diffusion is inseparable and inalienable from you. Go, be happy in the good you have won, and in the good you do. The phantom, which had held its bloodless hand above him while it spoke, as if in some unholy invocation or some ban, and which had gradually advanced its eyes so close to his that he could see how they did not participate in the terrible smile upon its face, but were a fixed, unalterable, steady horror, melted before him, and was gone. As he stood rooted to the spot, possessed by fear and wonder, and imagining he heard repeated in melancholy echoes, dying away fainter and fainter, the words, Destroy its like in all whom you approach. A shrill cry reached his ears. It came not from the passage beyond the door, but from another part of the old building, and sounded like the cry of someone in the dark who had lost the way. He looked confusedly upon his hands and limbs, as if to be assured of his identity, and then shouted in reply, loudly and wildly, for there was a strangeness and terror upon him, as if he too were lost. The cry responding, and being nearer, he caught up the lamp and raised a heavy curtain in the wall, by which he was accustomed to pass into and out of the theatre where he lectured, which adjoined his room. Associated with youth and animation, and a high amphitheatre of faces which his entrance charmed to interest in a moment, it was a ghostly place when all this life was faded out of it, and stared upon him like an emblem of death. Hello, he cried. Hello, this way. Come to the light. When, as he held the curtain with one hand, and with the other raised the lamp and tried to pierce the gloom that filled the place, something rushed past him into the room like a wildcat and crouched down in a corner. "'What is it?' he said hastily. He might have asked what is it, even had he seen it well, as presently he did when he stood looking at it gathered up in its corner. A bundle of tatters, held together by a hand in size and form almost an infant's, but in its greedy, desperate little clutch a bad old man's. A face rounded and smoothed by some half-dozen years, but pinched and twisted by the experiences of a life. Bright eyes, but not youthful. Naked feet, beautiful in their childish delicacy, ugly in the blood and dirt that cracked upon them. A baby savage, a young monster, a child who had never been a child, a creature who might live to take the outward form of man, but who within would live and perish a mere beast. Used already to be worried and hunted like a beast, the boy crouched down as he was looked at, and looked back again, and interposed his arm to ward off the expected blow. "'I'll bite,' he said, "'if you hit me.' The time had been, and not many minutes since, when such a sight as this would have wrung the chemist's heart. He looked upon it now coldly, but with a heavy effort to remember something, he did not know what, he asked the boy what he did there, and whence he came. "'Where's the woman?' he replied. "'I want to find the woman.' "'Who?' "'The woman. "'Her that brought me here and set me by the large fire. "'She was so long gone that I went to look for her and lost myself. "'I don't want you. "'I want the woman.' "'He made a spring so suddenly to get away "'that the dull sound of his naked feet upon the floor "'was near the curtain when Redlaw caught him by his rags.' "'Come, you let me go!' muttered the boy, struggling and clenching his teeth. "'I've done nothing to you. Let me go, will you, to the woman?' "'That is not the way. There is a nearer one,' 
said Redlaw, detaining him in the same blank effort to remember some association that ought of right to bear upon this monstrous object. What is your name? Got none. Where do you live? Live? What's that? The boy shook his hair from his eyes to look at him for a moment, and then, twisting round his legs and wrestling with him, broke again into his repetition of, You let me go, will you? I want to find the woman. The chemist led him to the door. This way, he said, looking at him still confusedly, but with repugnance and avoidance growing out of his coldness. I'll take you to her. The sharp eyes in the child's head, wandering round the room, lighted on the table where the remnants of the dinner were. Give me some of that, he said covetously. Has she not fed you? I shall be hungry again tomorrow, shan't I? Ain't I hungry every day? Finding himself released, he bounded at the table like some small animal of prey, and hugging to his breast bread and meat and his own rags altogether, said, There! Now take me to the woman! As the chemist, with a newborn dislike to touch him, sternly motioned him to follow, and was going out of the door, he trembled and stopped. The gift that I have given, you shall give again, go where you will. The phantom's words were blowing in the wind, and the wind blew chill upon him. I'll not go there tonight, he murmured faintly. I'll go nowhere tonight. Boy, straight down this long-arched passage and past the great dark door into the yard. You see the fire shining on the window there. The woman's fire? inquired the boy. He nodded, and the naked feet had sprung away. He came back with his lamp, locked his door hastily, and sat down in his chair, covering his face like one who was frightened at himself. For now he was indeed alone, alone, alone. End of chapter 1